Well, most of you know that my son was diagnosed with cancer in two different places. They removed a tumor off of his spine and also uh, went in eight different places in his colon. Well, he is cancer free of that now. He's, that he is Praise able to walk. Thank you, Lord. Real good without stumbling. And he hasn't had any more back pain since it was removed. There's, they still have to deal with the cancer of the prostate, but they said that was the least of their worries. But they sent it off, and, and everything's fine with him. My sister-in-law, Martha, that was given two weeks to live, has <laughs> been living like two months ago. several months yeah. already, and she's still going strong, fighting her family the whole way, being on hospice. <laughs> so I praise God for both of those answers to prayer. Amen. Yes, yes. Isn't that great? I love this. Tonight, uh, I got to tell you, uh, of all the characters and of all the things we've shared about Christmas so far, I'm going to tell you this is my second favorite of all the, the, of the Christmas story. Amy's is going to have my favorite. Mary is my favorite. And I can hardly wait to hear a lady comment on a lady. Because, you know, us men, we think differently than you women do. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, that left and right brain thing. Uh, Kathy has, you know, a thousand boxes and they're all opened at one time. I have a thousand boxes, but I open one at a time. And every one of her boxes connect, every one of mine is separate. And I can close all my boxes and sit down and watch TV and not open a box. She can't. And so, but that's the difference. But, but it'll be interesting from a lady's point of view, the story of Mary. So be here and hear that. That's going to be great. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the shepherds. The window of worship. Uh, I, I've heard probably all my, realistically, I've probably every, every year I've heard a sermon on the shepherds. I mean, that's, that's standard, right? And so as I was studying, I said, oh Lord, let me find something unique about the shepherds that maybe I didn't know before. And so I just started researching, and, and of course the book we're all using, Ben gave me a book, and I was so excited about it, and I said, well, Ben, why did you give it to me uh, towards the end of December? He said, because I knew you would preach on it. And so I said, next year, next year. And so we, I, I bought extra books, and we all have one, and we, we've gone through them, and uh, it's been interesting, the writer, and, and the different things he's brought out about the Christmas story. But I, I dug a little deeper, and I found out some interesting things. But first of all, let me tell you what a shepherd is. A shepherd is, or sheep herder is a person who herds, uh, tends sheep, feeds, guards, flocks of sheep. Uh, shepherding is one of the world's oldest occupations. I did, uh, I'm like Johnny Carson. I did not know that. Now, some of you younger ones won't understand that pun, but uh, I love that when he would do that. I did not know that. It exists all parts of the globe. Every country has a shepherd in it somewhere. Every country has sheep. Sheep are not as big a sale as cattle. And right now, the United States is right on the borderline of losing, being number one in the cattle industry. Kind of interesting. And we're in one of the, the, the states that is in the top five, Missouri. And, and, and it's kind of interesting. But sheep uh, are kept, there, there's several reasons for sheep. Number one, they are kept primarily for their milk, meat, and especially for their wool. That's a big thing. Sheep get along with other barnyard animals and are normally very calm creatures. Uh, you ever heard the story that if one sheep goes over a cliff, they'll all follow them. They just, they're followers. Isn't it ironic that we're compared to sheep with Jesus? And that's not part of the sermon. I just threw that in for free. But we're in that way. But they, uh, they're basically defenseless against predators. They really can't fight back. A wolf or a bear or whatever comes after them, they're, they're really defenseless. The only thing they can really do is run. <laughs> kind of interesting. And so they're not known for their intelligence. Hmm, this is getting worse as we go, isn't it? And they tend to wander off from the fold and become endangered. Does that sound like us sometimes? We just kind of tend to wander off. Anyway, 
That's not in my sermon either, but um, that's, that was another freebie. Most shepherds uh, in, in that time of Jesus' birth, were, they were, pay scale was low. They, did, they didn't make much. Some of them owned their own herds, some of them didn't. If you owned your own herd, you made a little bit more, but not even, that wasn't a high dollar business. The way they made their money is the demand, supply and demand. So they had all these, these sheep, and so they, they used them for several different things. One of them, uh, that it was a high dollar deal because they, they used them in the temple for sacrificing. And of course the meat, we all know that, and of course the clothing was all made out of wool. They didn't have polyester like we do have today. And, and so anyway, uh, their livelihood depended on the sheep surviving. That was an important thing. That's why they slept with them night and day. Can you imagine when the shepherd came to town to get supplies? It was like, oh, the shepherd's here. Sheep herder's here. Uh, you know, if they, if they took a bath, it was in, they found a stream, and they had to be really careful because... They not only uh, drank out of that stream, but that sometimes became food for fish. And, and so they had to be careful not to pollute it with their bodies, you know, with the, and so they were careful in that way. So they didn't take too many baths. They, they weren't known to be really, you know, sharp dressers. Uh, and so anyway, a little fun things about him. Luke one thirty one. this is our key scripture throughout this, is listen. Oh, there's that word, listen. I love that word. Uh, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and shall call his name Jesus. Shepherds were simple men with simple lives. They weren't worried about really anything but sheep. That was, that, you know, they didn't, they, they didn't have cable TV. They didn't have cell phones. That, that might have been a blessing, I don't know. <laughs> and so first of all they bought and used the lambs for sacrificial and temple worship now the criteria for a lamb is it had to be without blemish so that means they had to really take care of their sheep they had to make sure they um, you know no diseases no if, if you know they had to really take care of them because that was their livelihood more than you know and so a blemish sheep means no sale in the temple. And that was their primary use. The wool for clothing, blankets, meat and milk, primary source of food for their time. I don't know. I, I, I've tried lamb a couple times and I just can't really get into it. Give me a steak and I'm good. But give me a lamb chop, I don't know. So they were, they were, they were operated by low-income personnel. So uh, most of them would, and if they had a scale of today, it wouldn't have even been minimum wage. And so that's a, kind of interesting. Uh, twofold dilemma. By nature of their work, they stayed with them 24 7. It wasn't a break. Uh, kids didn't worry about school, they didn't go to school, they were taught. Mom taught out there, right out in the middle of the herd. She would sit down with the kiddos and say, Here we go. You're going to learn today. And they would, their main book was the Bible. Why are the scriptures? Of course, they didn't have the Bible. I wonder if they had King James. No, they didn't. They didn't. I wonder if they had the MEV. No, no, that hadn't come around yet. So, and then second of all, the shepherds and sheep herders were always in need of cleaning up. Always. Could you imagine if you were to be asked out on a date by a shepherd? Yeah, that, that could be, you know, you, you wanted to make sure it was open air cafe, yeah, but anyway. But interesting, all through the scripture, now I've kind of laid kind of a bleak thing for a shepherd. This, they were not looked upon as well. They, 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 they were the, the, the low of the low. And if you hang out with a shepherd or a sheep herder, uh, you might get branded yourself, labeled yourself. But God has a way of using people in a, what I call amazing moments. <laughs> Things that are out of the norm. And I'll give you an example before I, I, I get in where I'm going tonight. Uh, unique happenings or heavenly splendors. However you want to call it. 
God does things with people that are out of the norm that you'd say, I wonder why God did it that way. Well, he always has a purpose. Let me give you one of those. Uh, we don't think like God, and, and probably it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> we don't have that high level of understanding or intelligence or wisdom. But uh, he loves attention getters. You ever notice that? I'll see, I'm going to give you an example of one. One of them was, uh, well, one of the lowest of society uh, was Zacchaeus. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Oh, I love the story. He was a short man. Uh, this morning, Johnny and I were talking about a mutual friend. I didn't know he knew uh, Rod, who did some of my music. When as it, I wrote a song for BGMC, and Rod Kettleman did the music for me. And, it, and in, I think it was 95 or 96, it was the theme song for BGMC. And it was just great. And so Rod came in and took my lyrics and he said, all you have to do is sing it to me and I'll figure it out. And then you come down and record it. I said, oh, let's do it. When I got there, he had it all done and ready for me to do my part. And all he did is some fill-in music and it, it was great. I said, Rod, how, how can you just possibly do this? But Rod was very talented and he was a very short man. Out of all of his family were, were big bruisers and he was, he was a dwarf. He was, uh, and when, when he turned 30 years old, <laughs> he said, he called me one day and he said, Jim, I'm alive. Well, that, I think that's obvious. Talking to you on the phone, I, I don't think this is, you know, a voice from the, you know, I, I don't think we have a direct line to heaven. And, uh, but he said, no, he said, you don't understand, I'm a dwarf. If they live past 30, it's a miracle. If they live past 35, it's unheard of. And I'm, I'm past 30, 35. I'm, I, I've just had my birthday, and I, I'm excited about that. And he was all excited. I remember Big Dan Rector, who was a dwarf, and he called me one day, and he said, Jim, I'm 40. I don't know why these guys call me. Why do they call me? I don't know. But they were friends. or good friends. And he said, Jim, I turned 40. I'm still alive. It's like, I've heard this story before. Are you related to Rod? You know, and so they, and, and so a lot of times, you know, uh, and Big Dan Rector is still alive today, and he's Oh my goodness, he's probably uh, late 70s, early 80s. And so, you know, <laughs> doctors don't know it all, do they? We found that out many times. So here's a short man that was a tax collector. Now there's another low of lows, because they were dishonest. Nine out of 10 tax collectors of Jesus' times were dishonest. They would overcharge you, and guess what they pocketed? Whatever they charged you beyond, what you owed Caesar was theirs. And so they, and so if, you know, if you got suckered once, they'll come back again. And, and they were always, he was not liked because they knew that, people knew that. So all of a sudden, uh, Jesus is walking and he stops. Now just think about this. Crowds all around him, people are just everywhere. Zacchaeus climbs up in a sycamore tree so he can see Jesus. He can't see over the crowd. And he, excuse me, excuse me. And they're, no, 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 get away. We were here first. Have you ever gone to a parade? Oh, my word. If you've never been to the Pasadena Rose Bowl parade, when they stand on that, that curb, that's their spot. And they don't let anybody in front of them. And they know how to use elbows to keep you away. I remember we used to get up early in the morning and get there at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Because oh, my mother wanted to go to the Rose Bowl parade. What is she thinking? So I would just bring my blanket and my pillow and I'd curl up on the curb and go to sleep till it started at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And, but uh, people got there early. That's what was happening. People were all around it. And Zacchaeus couldn't get through the crowd. So what did he do? He wanted to see Jesus. But at that amazing moment, Jesus sees him. And he's in that tree and he's peering you know, looking and seeing everything is going on, people all around him, and, and they just made a path room enough for Jesus. Can you see it in your mind? Can you visualize just hundreds of people just all in a line? Because one of them was hoping maybe he'll heal me, or maybe he'll stop and touch me, or, or maybe, he'll, maybe he'll give me, a, you know. Jesus was ministering constantly everywhere he went. So everybody had hope. Now this is an amazing moment. 
Luke 19.5 says this, when Jesus came by, came to the vicinity, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must remain at your house. That word remain means to spend time. We're going to hang out. We're going to say today, if Jesus was here today, he'd say, Zacchaeus, I'm going to hang out with you today. We're going to just come hang out together. So Zacchaeus, uh, first of all, he had this desire to see and find out who Jesus was. He just had this. And he was short in stature, so he needed to find a place. He found it. Curiosity killed the cat. Satisfaction brought it back. There he is. He's up. Now, can you see all this? How many can see this? Am I painting a good picture for you? He's up there hanging on. And I don't know if you've ever seen a sycamore tree over there. They're not big trees. (laughs) And they're kind of flimsy. So he's up there. And, of course, I imagine the wind blowing a little bit. And he's kind of... I, I see more of that probably what we read in Scripture, but, and I see him just kind of hanging on and, and, and looking and, and just doing all he can not to fall out of that tree. <laughs> and Jesus says, Zacchaeus. That's like, listen. <laughs> Called him by name. Listen. I'm going to go to your house today. So there it is. Secondly, he was an example of Christ's mission on the earth. That's who Christ came for. He came for people like Zacchaeus. We've been talking about the mission of Christ. Mission impossible? No, mission made possible. And so here it is. This is, this is his mission. Zacchaeus is part of his mission. Christ's message is to all. The undesirable as well, and the down and outer as well as the up and the up. It's for everybody. We were talking to a couple today, and he said, tell me a little bit about Marionville, our new couple of visitors. And I said, Marionville has it all. It has the very wealthy and the very poor and everything in between. We've got it all here. And he found that, you know what? Jesus came for all. And Zacchaeus fits in that category. His name was in the file folder. So get that picture. And now let's, uh, let's jump over to... Uh, uh, Luke 19, 8, and it says, But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Now this is after they spent some time together. Zacchaeus has had a change of heart. He has been, the Holy Spirit has convicted him. And, and just being, let me tell you, when you're, when you're in the presence of Jesus, you're convicted. There's something going on in your life that shouldn't be, you're convicted. And then you have a choice. Do I respond to that conviction? Or do I just keep living with it? I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot easier to respond and get it all out than just to live with it, because you're going to live with it, and live with it, and live with it, and die with it. Zacchaeus said, this is what he said in the 8th verse. He said, look, there's that word, look, listen, stop. You know, he's grabbing hold of Jesus' attention. He said, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will repay him for times as much. So if I've cheated anybody over a dollar, I'll give them $4. $100, I'll give them $400. Of course, I, I, their, their, their money is a little different than ours. True response, and it made a big splash. Can you imagine Zach is coming to somebody he had cheated out of $100 and said, you know, last year, your taxes, here, here's $400. I'm so sorry. What? A tax man returning money? What are you thinking? Are, are, are they going to send you the wacko word? Is there some guys in white coats around the corner going to snag you? And he'd say, no, I met Jesus. When you meet Jesus, it change, it's a life change. Now let's flip back to the shepherds. Lonely, lowly job. Not too many exciting or eventful things happen in your life. Uh, they lived a quiet and tranquil life. Uh, and all of a sudden, something's about to happen. It's going to change their life forever. Luke 8, or excuse me, Luke 2, 8 through 20. In the same area, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Something was about to happen that was way bigger than they could ever imagine. There was no anticipation because they didn't know it was coming. They had, no, they had no clue. But it would change their life, and it was powerful. 
to make biblical history and social history. You know what? You can find this on Google, and you can find more of a detailed account in history than you can in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Everything God does, he confirms back in, in the Word of God. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were, they were very afraid. You can imagine, you're a shepherd, nothing's been happening. Uh, you're, the only exciting thing is your herd has increased by 25%. One of your ewes had twins. Uh, that's not an everyday occurrence in sheep. But, you know, uh, found a new way to cook lamb. That could be exciting. Uh, tired of the lamb all the time? Well, let's get a new cookbook. You know, but here it comes. I put, the, I put down in my notes, here or here it comes. Here or here. That's that English language that we have that no other country has. There's five ways to say one word, and, you know, we can be confused by it. But the angel said to him, listen, there's that word, listen again, all through the scripture. Do not fear, for I bring you, what? Good news of great joy, which will be for who? All people. I underscored that because that's going to be an important part of what we're going. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Hmm, wow. This is getting better and better. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Wow, that's good news. Something exciting is happening. Woo! Don't go away. There's more to come. Ah, yeah. But part two of the announcement, excitement has got to be building. They just settle down from the first one. They just fear not. Okay, okay. I think, I think this is a good thing. I, can you, can, how many can imagine what's going on here? They're, they're still in shock. Some of them, their eyes are still, they haven't blinked in three minutes. They're just still, you know, are you getting the picture? This is, sometimes we forget this is, this is a great part of the story. And the head shepherd makes two decisions that day. First decision is who gets to see this baby and who gets to stay and watch the sheep. I can just see it. Well, Junior, you're not quite old enough to tag with us, so you stay and we're going to, because we're the mature ones. We're the ones, you know. So anyway, whatever. And so suddenly there was with an, the angel, a company of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Still in shock. They're making those two decisions. 15th verse says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let us go to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. The Lord has made known to us. They were, they were in shock. They, they weren't, remember, they're the, the lower group. So they came hurrying and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby lying in a manger. There's excitement in the air. There's excitement in the air. Can you see it? The angels appear. Announcement given. You find the baby. He's as cute as Claire. Isn't Claire cute? And she's the cutest thing you ever seen. He's, he's a, I, I think Jesus was a good looking baby. He dirty diapers like every other baby. But he's a good looking baby. I think he was a good looking kid. I think there was a glow about him. I think there was something that if she was walking downtown with him, they'd say, Wow, what's with that baby? Who is that baby? You ever notice how much, uh, and, and I love Ryder and Amber putting bows on her head, and decking her out. I mean, and I imagine whenever she, they take her and she's got a bow on her head and she's all dolled up, they go, oh, so cute. Someone said one time, they said, oh, look at there, a newborn baby. And I said, have you ever seen an old born baby? I, have, I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen we get bald when we, when we were born and then we get our hair and then we get bald again I don't know that, not all of us, there's some of us but <laughs> words to describe their feelings and emotions excited, would that be one? breathtaking oh I think so spectacular I mean, stop and think, right? Am I, am I on? have you ever thought of those kind of things? how they're feeling? We read the story, but if we ever understand magnificent, oh, I love these words, humbling. The angels came to us, shepherds. Oh, my goodness. 
I was humbled one day at our church at Parkrest when I went to headquarters. Hmm. I wanted to meet Raymond Carlson so bad. But you have to understand, in those days, there's 1,100 people in the building. And I didn't expect him to show up my office door and say, Jim, I'd like to see you. I'd like to meet you, get to know you. But we were in church and attended Parkrest. And our pastor, Bob Strand, remember Bob? He, he came, he was our pastor. And, and he said, you know, one of these days I, I want to get uh, Raymond together with you. And I was thinking, Raymond, Raymond, you're not talking about Brother Carlson, are you? They're on first name basis. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'd love that. Any, you name the day, I'll, whatever, I'll, I'll clear my calendar for that. And we were sitting on the very, I was sitting on the very, I like to sit on the edge. I'm on the edge anyway. But I like to sit on the very end of the pew. And, and we were, there was four sections and I was sitting on the fourth section on the end about the fourth or fifth row back. Brother Carlson came in and sat in the third section on that end on the same row I was in. I could hardly wait for howdy and greet. I was ready. Bob I always did this thing of everybody stand up, find three people, shake hands with them, to say something good to them. And uh, I could, I mean, I was, I was like a, I had my one foot behind, you know, like a runner coming out of the starting block. And I want, because I knew everybody and their dog would come shake hands with him. And he jumped up and came over to me before I could even get up. And he reached down and he shook my hand. And as he shook my hand, he, he covered the other, both hands and he said, Jim, it's so good to meet you. <laughs> and I'm going, I just got, I was melting right there in my seat. I'm melting, I'm melting. I mean, it was, and, and I was so humbled by that. And he said, I read, I said, every, every month I go through all the new people who come and I, I saw your name and uh, I, I'm glad I saw you today. I saw your picture and as soon as I saw you, I knew I had to come greet you. I was so humbled. He, he, he's, as some of you know who G. Raymond Carlson, and he, he's one of the greatest men in the Assemblies of God. He's gone on to his reward now. And someday I think he'll be at the gate and say, hey, Jim, you made it. I don't know if he'll be astonished or happy. I don't know. <laughs> but I was humbled by that. Can you imagine how the shepherds felt? They were humbled. Right. I'm a shepherd. And you... This whole host of angels came for us. Are you getting a pretty good picture here? Are you, are, are you seeing something? Just They were overwhelmed with joy, splendor. Oh my goodness, they so excited. It's a Kodak moment. <laughs> they didn't have cameras. Oh my goodness. How did they make it? Someone get a, a notepad and a sketch and let's try this out. No, just kidding. <laughs> Luke's description challenges our ma imagination. And it really thrills our heart as well. You stop and think about that. I know I'm over-exaggerating, but I don't really think I am. I think they were so shocked, astonished, amazed, humbled. I, I think all those emotions just floated around and they didn't know, even know how to express it. They, they didn't even know what to say. Other than when, when the angels went, they said, let's get going. we got to find this baby. <laughs> I mean, they took all the trouble to come to see us and tell us about the baby. We're going to go see the baby. And, and off they went. 17th verse. And when they seen him, they made widely known the word which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled. There's another one of those excitable words. At what the shepherds told them. Marveled. Now I'm going to tell you something about shepherds. Even though they're the low life of their time, they were the networkers. They were communication people. They knew how to communicate. And they knew how to take care of each other. They, they're, they're a great example to us as, as a church because they looked out at each other because they had the biggest industry in the country and they were the low life. Now can you imagine that? You're, you're, you're in the high dollar business. You're not making much, but boy, you're selling sheep right and left. They're using them in the temple. They're using them for meat. They're shearing the, the wool. And they've got all this industry going, and they're still considered low life. And don't you know, they know how to network with people. 
when they have part of their herd ready for market, they know how to communicate. They knew how to talk it up. This is part of their culture. Now, some of you that have owned businesses before, you know how advertisement works. But these were advertisers. These were, these were, these were marketeers, let me tell you. They knew how to market their product. Because if a sheep got too old, it was too tough to eat. And if it got too old, and, and then it was a liability and they had to feed something, it could die easy. And if it got too old, they don't want them in the temple. So they, they, were, they were communicators. They began to communicate what they had seen and heard, and the news spread. And I love this part. I know you'll probably share this, Amy, but uh, that's okay. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Don't you know, oh, she was feeling a bit overwhelmed here. She knew who she had in that cradle. She knew who was in that stall right there. She knew laying in that hay was the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And here comes the shepherds. And they worshiped Jesus. They praised God for the opportunity. <laughs> Dear diary, you won't believe what happened to me today. I don't know if they kept diaries in those days. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe they did. This story will be told right up to 2023. It never ends. And it's told every, every year. They praise God for what happened to them. Little did they know they were the opening curtain. <laughs> it was all about them. They had no idea. Can you imagine the shepherd sitting there and saying, well, you know, someday in 2023... Pastors are going to be talking about us. They're going to be doing Easter and, and Christmas and all about the Christ child. And guess what? We were the first. They had no clue. They had no clue. And yet they made history like no other persons. <laughs> so did Herod, but in a bad way. Verse 20. <laughs> this is so good. We're going to wrap up with this. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it had been told them. <laughs> glory of the Lord. You hear the Shekinah glory preached about. I think there was some glory about that. The Shekinah glory. I love that. The brightness, the perfection of the all-sufficient God. The evidence of his presence was right there in front of them. It was no longer prophecy at that point. It was reality. Prophecy was fulfilled at that very moment. Even their part. Isn't that fascinating? I love it. It's kind of an example of God's blessings of grace and peace in our life. Psalms 57, 5 says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. May your glory be above the earth. If you want to get fascinated with something, look up the word glory in your concordance or go over to Bible Gateway and type in just glory and hit enter. Find out how many times glory is listed and mentioned in the Bible. You'll be astonished. In fact, I don't think you'd want me to recall them all tonight. I think you'd want to go home before midnight. 1 Peter 1.7 In order that the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than the gold that perishes, though it's tried by fire, may be found to result in, in praise. Let me start that scripture again. Am I reading this right? In order that the genuineness of your faith. Hmm. You know, I bought this wallet a while back. And when I looked at it, I said, it was in the leather section, and I bought it. And after I bought it, and I got it home, and I said, this is so great. I got an old leather wallet. I never, I've always got the cheap Walmart ones, you know, that fall apart in about a year. I have so many. And then I looked, and it says, genuine imitation leather. <laughs> it looks like leather, feels like leather, but it's not. You know, but anyway. 
It's a real deal. In order that the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tried by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory. There's that word glory again, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I had an assistant pastor, uh, kind of like what Ryler and Amy and Chuck do for me here, that he preached for me quite often. And he loved to end with this scripture. And, and I, I thought of Pete as I was putting this together because he loved the story of the shepherds. And he'd always come to me. Uh, he was with me for uh, almost four of the nine years we were there. And every Christmas for four years, he'd come and said, can I talk about the shepherds? Can I, can I preach about them? Can, will you let me have that one? And I said, okay, Pete, it's yours. And he, oh, wow. He just gets so excited. And, and boy, he, and he'd whip out his notes and redo them. And, but he always ended with this scripture. A lot of pastors do. Kathy's been saying, you know, we need to do this too. But in Numbers 6, 24 through 26, it's a real popular scripture. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I thought, when those shepherds got back to the herd, do you know they talked for months about that? Don't you know that, that every night they would say, did, did you see, that? I got to hold Jesus. Did you? No. Well, how come you got to hold him? I want, it's kind of like, you know, we fight over Claire. I want to, no, I, no, uh, you know, when there's 20 or 30 or, I don't know how many shepherds showed up, but there was a lot of, and you know, only, you know, a good mother's not going to let everybody hold that baby. So you got to pick and choose. Well, he looks pretty strong. He won't drop baby Jesus. <laughs> when James was real small, uh, he was born early, and he was five pounds, and, and I, I could hold him right here in my arms. And I'll never forget, we went to church the first, I mean, we, we were in church. We, I, he wasn't even three days older when we were in church. And I said, Pastor, we want you to dedicate our baby. And he was so tickled to do that. John Watson was such a wonderful man of God. And he said, when do you want to do this? And I said, you tell us your schedule. And he gave us the schedule. And so we, we grabbed it. And, we, and, and I'll never forget, as I walked in the door, uh, we had a, a smaller guy walk up that was real, just kind of frail. And he said, can I hold your baby? You know, I don't know. You're not going to drop James, are you? And those thoughts come to Come on. Am I the only one? I'm, if we're honest, we'll, we, you know. And, and so it was like, well, you know, he's not crying right now. You know, you kind of start jiggling him like he could cry at any moment, you know. I, I see, I was a good actor. I got the nomination for best actor. And so I said, well, he's, you know, he's, he's been real quiet. And he just, we just, maybe we shouldn't wake him up. And he said, oh, but I just, he was one of our, our youth sponsors that worked with us in the youth. And so he said, oh, I, just, I would just love to hold your baby. He said, because we had ministered to him and, and he just wanted to hold James. And I looked over at Kathy and she was not, not close to me. I was hoping Kathy would say, oh, let me come take him and you know, find a reason she had to make off with him. But she didn't. <laughs> and so I handed James over to this guy. I can't even remember his name. He was the nicest guy, sweet personality. Kind of reminds you of a Gary Volland, actually. That sweet personality Gary had. And he just held that baby and he, he just looked at it and he cried and he said, wow, I get, I, I'm the first one in the church to hold your baby. And, and I'm thinking, how did the shepherds feel when they, the, the first shepherd that held baby Jesus, I'm the first one to, to hold this baby outside of mama and dad. Oh, my goodness. And I imagine all of a sudden their hands just made sure they were 
you know, my nightmare is anytime I dedicate a baby that you know, doesn't wiggle and, you know, and I'm always afraid of that. Amy was so good at trusting me with Claire, though. She was, she kept going. Can you imagine? Now, I know I'm having fun with this, but can you imagine Mary? Well, I, I guess so. But you know who you're holding? You know whose face you're kissing? I love the, and we'll sing it Christmas Eve, Sunday when Mary did you know. You're, you're holding the very one who's going to deliver you. Wow, that's overwhelming. That's overwhelming. What an honor. And then another, well, well, can I hold him too? And when they got back to the fire where the other guys were, I imagine the first thing out of some of those guys' mouth, do you know I got to hold baby Jesus? I got to hold the Savior in my hands. And the significant thing about that is actually Jesus had them in his hands. And you stop and think about it. Isn't that a great analogy? I thought of that all by myself. <laughs> While they were holding baby Jesus, actually he was holding them. Oh, let's honor the Jesus. The, the hero of heroes, the, the Lord of lords. Uh, that's right. That was their window of worship, and they took advantage of it. And, I, and as they left, it said... <laughs> Let me read this to you again. They returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen and had been told them. Tonight, let's think about how precious our Lord and Savior is to us. You know, they got to hold Him as a baby, but we know Him as our Savior. We have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's special. And I don't know about you, but there's times where I have, I think I've felt the hands of Jesus around me, holding me, close to me, lovingly. And, and there's times I just whispered the name of Jesus, and I know he was so close that he could just hear every syllable, Jesus, Jesus. So tonight as we come around the altars, Chuck, do you want to, I know you'll disappear behind the stage here, but if you want to come to the, to the piano and just play some, just turn it real soft and just play some music. I'm going to challenge you tonight, uh, and, and we've got prayer lists and you can go through, but I, I, I want to challenge you tonight as you come, as you find a place to pray, and will you say, Lord, you're the most precious thing in the world, the most precious gift in the world. Not ever a gift has been given so good, so precious, so wonderful. It's the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I was talking to someone the other day, and I was really broken hearted about it. In fact, when I got home, I, I sat down on the couch and Kathy said, you look all doom and gloom. And I said, I just talked to a person who thinks there's many ways to heaven. And one of the ways that they've chosen is Buddha. And I said, I was so distraught with that. So deceived. And, it's, and, and I, just, I just sat there for a few minutes and I, I just began to pray, Lord, help them to find truth. Help them to find the reality that you are the only way. You are the only way. And my next meeting with them, I'm hoping... I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will lead me to say the right thing. And I said, oh God, next time I, I meet, may I have your words, may I have your thoughts, may I have your heart to reach out and, and touch that person. But we have the real deal, folks. Amen. My Jesus not only died, but he raised again and he's in heaven waiting for us. Gabriel's going to make one more a big assignment, and that's to call us home. And I'm listening for that trumpet. I'm listening for that trumpet. Lord, I thank you tonight for the shepherds. Their story is phenomenal. The wise men were great men in, in their countries. They were known in the region. They were, they were known in that world of, of where they were. And, and, but the shepherds, 
weren't known by anybody, and yet you chose them. It was a magnificent moment. It, it was one of those moments in time <laughs> that you shined, Lord Jesus. So I, I, I pray tonight as, as, we, as we spend some time in prayer, may we, may we be caught up in the awe of who you are. I know, Lord, I, I'm just so excited. I, I love Christmas. I love the time of the year. I, I love the season. I love the lights, the glitter, the tree. But God, it's all about you. As Ryder shared this morning, the colors of Christmas are so magnificent. The tree represents eternal life. But God, I know you as Lord and Savior. May we have the awe of who you are as the shepherds did this Christmas season. And I pray if there's anyone here that has just kind of slipped back in kind of a complacent heart towards who you are, to what we're celebrating, God, that you will speak to their hearts. And Lord, they'll, they'll take tonight and just get right back where they need to be with you. And we pray that in your name, the name of Jesus, the name above all names. And we thank you and praise you for it in your precious name.